move in to protect public health officials after a threat to start shooting and bring on a civil war if Colorado's stay-home orders aren't lifted. Aurora's mayor's frustrated that he's getting political answers to public health questions, like whether Aurora should mandate masks. A giant of Colorado's civil rights scene leaves the hospital after weeks on a ventilator fighting COVID-19. Our state senators hold dueling town halls tonight in very different settings. Set aside coronavirus. Where did Colorado's other sick people go all of a sudden? And each mural a monument to the people who are saving the day. Let's hear it for the teachers. Next. Some of Colorado's most prominent public health leaders are under increasing political pressure and now the threat of physical violence. Police are protecting Tri-County Health Department after the doctors there received a threat that there would be shooting and a coming civil war if they did not immediately lift stay-home orders. Tri-County Health acknowledges that politics played a role in its decision not to recommend a public mask order like the one in Denver. Steve Steger starts us off tonight with a look at public health, politics, and the threat of violence. The email threatening civil war started on a kind note from the inbox of a receptionist at Tri-County Health Department in Greenwood Village. Quote, I know you're the receptionist and not responsible for these edicts, but tell the nine petty tyrants who want to keep locking most of Colorado down to bleep off. We the people are done with this bleeping bull bleep, and you're about to start a hot shooting, no bull bleep civil war. The bleeps are bad words. Greenwood Village police say, though they don't consider this a crime, they are stepping up patrols around that office. The email, not the only sign of pressure at a Tri-County office. Over in Aurora, police are investigating four reports of vandalism at a Tri-County satellite office in three weeks, from breaking windows to spray painting another bleep on the window earlier this week. The pressure is on the large health department on the collar of Denver, and it may be getting hot enough that the Tri-County Health Department is steering away from public health orders. At a board meeting this morning, Dr. John Douglas, the executive director, argued against a mask order, saying public health orders have been politicized and there is fatigue in the public, suggesting instead that cities make their own decisions while Tri-County focuses on educating the public on how masks work. Now, throughout this pandemic, Tri-County has been the target of political pressure. You might remember several Republican leaders wanted Douglas County to fire that health department when it was trying to impose a stay-at-home order before the state of Colorado did back in March. Now, that pressure led Tri-County to leave Douglas County out of an extended stay-at-home order, which expires on Friday, Kyle. So Tri-County is leaving whether to do a public mask order up to municipalities. And if those municipalities want to, say, contact their public health experts about it, they pick up the phone and call, oh, yeah, Tri-County Health Department. They don't have their own health experts. Yeah, you think about the city and county of Denver has its own health department. So in that case... They consulted with their health department and decided to pass this mask order. But when it comes to all the little jurisdictions inside that three county, Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas, they all have to consult with Tri-County Health when it comes to public health issues. Steve Sager, thank you very much. Aurora's Republican Mayor Mike Kaufman told me today that threats of physical violence over public health orders are sad and tragic. Kaufman is in a challenging spot, so he's the Republican mayor of a large and diverse city that shares a health department with the more conservative Douglas County. Kaufman criticized Tri-County Health for carving out Doug Co. when they decided to extend the stay-home order and the rest of their jurisdiction. And Kaufman is frustrated that the head of Tri-County Health did not give Aurora clear guidance on whether to join Denver in requiring masks in public a decision in part due to politics. It leads us in, a, in an odd position. I mean, uh, technically the fact that 
we are not, we don't have public health authority at the municipal level. We are not a city and a county government like Denver. Public health is at the county and the state level of government. Uh, but we still have concerns, but it puts us in an opposition because we don't have our own public health department. We don't have public health experts at the municipal level. We rely on his judgment. We rely on the judgment of Tri-County Health Department. Fears of politicization seems like a, a bad way to make public health policy because uh, the public health and science doesn't really care about politics. What role do you think that has played in all this? And what would you like to see change going forward? Well, first of all, we don't, you know, we're not looking uh, to him for political advice. We're, we're looking to Tri-County Health for, for public health advice, for public health guidance, because they are the public health entity that represents the city of Aurora. I think there needs to be significant reform of the system. Uh, I really do think that, I think Governor Polis has done a good job, uh, but I, I do think, and, and there have been a lot of complaints about having non-elected boards having such incredible authority that was never, I think they were created statutorily uh, by a legislature that ever envisioned a pandemic crisis like this. Mayor Kaufman is asking for a meeting on Monday with the head of Tri-County Health to ask some specific questions about whether Aurora should mandate masks. And he wants to make a recording of that meeting public. For Aurora to get its own health department, it would need to become a city and county like Denver. That is a complex process. I discuss it with Mayor Kaufman in our full interview on the next YouTube channel. The number of Coloradans who are in the hospital with COVID-19 continues to trend down. It's going in an encouraging direction, folks. 636 people are currently in the hospital for COVID. 58 have been discharged or transferred within the last 24 hours. Now testing, our testing rate continues to creep up on a daily basis. We're currently processing more than 3,000 tests a day. Now that is still well below the state's goal of 5,000 tests a day for early May. Farther still from the 8,500 tests a day goal that the state set for the end of the month. And we recall the governor's original testing goal of 10,000 a day. Colorado's COVID-19 hotspots continue to rack up new cases. 280 JBS meatpacking employees in Greeley have now tested positive, up from 245 earlier in the week. We know that seven JBS employees have died. Another 21 inmates at the Sterling Correctional Facility have tested positive. 262 positive tests at that prison so far, and one inmate has died. At least 10 jails and prisons in Colorado have reported outbreaks. You can add to that list Denver's downtown detention center. The deadliest outbreak spot in Colorado is the Cherry Creek Nursing Center in Aurora, where 23 residents have died. Down in San Miguel County, they had high hopes of testing each and every resident twice, thanks to a unique arrangement with a lab. They didn't get to all 8,000 residents in round one, and they're not even sure when round two might begin. But they do have test results from round one. San Miguel says that 2% of the people tested in the general population definitely or might have had COVID-19. So they tested 5,455 people. They got 29 positives, 79 borderline results. There are some locals that have a hookup with a testing company, and that's why San Miguel is getting these general population tests. The issue is their lab in New York is so backed up, they can't even guess when they might be able to do a second round of testing. A well-known minister from Denver could have become the, one of the most prominent Coloradans to lose their life to COVID-19. Reverend Terrence Hughes, a well-known civil rights leader, spent weeks on a ventilator at the VA hospital. But he got out of there today so that he can continue his recovery. And our Sonia Gutierrez was there. 60 days ago, the Colorado VA Hospital admitted its first COVID-19 patient. Everybody knows him in the community by Big T. Terrence Hughes, the Denver civil rights leader. The poor, the oppressed, the needy, the homeless, the anybody who doesn't seem like they have a voice for themselves. You know, he has a big heart for that. Reverend of the people. He truly is directed by the Lord. In ICU for so long, even doctors said it was extraordinary for this day to come. <laughs> hospital staff, friends, and family lined the doors of the hospital. 
receiving a veteran who recovered from COVID-19 stronger than doctors thought possible. It's a long time not to be near somebody. Close to seven weeks on a ventilator, his wife, Rachel Hughes, was finally getting to see him. Even if it's from a distance, I get to see him and, and I have to hold back the, the urge to run up and kiss all over him and hug him. She had strict rules not to get close to him until the 14 days of rehab quarantine are over. But she couldn't resist having him so close. She fought off COVID-19 too, while her husband was in the hospital battling the same virus. A man who never thought twice about helping other people received that love back when his family needed it most. So grateful that people would care that much because he pours his heart out and is all out to the community. So it's very nice to see it being poured back in to him when he needed it. For next, I'm Sonia Gutierrez. Big T's going straight from the hospital into a rehab center where again, he'll be in quarantine for 14 days. The hope is that then at that point, he'll be able to go home. His family told us they can't wait for that. As this was ramping up, we were really getting, pre preparing ourselves to see sort of a New York City level overwhelming of our system. Denver is not New York, obviously and thankfully. And you're not just hearing fewer sirens, it's the fewest. So where did all the other sick people go? And good teachers instill gratitude. We're ready to send some of it back their way. Next. Colorado senators are doing simultaneous town halls tonight, virtually, of course, but still unusual. Uh, originally, Democratic Senator Michael Bennett and Republican Senator Cory Gardner were listed as participants in a League of Women Voters Facebook event about defending democracy. Bennett will be there. Gardner instead is going to hold a town hall for members of the fan club of a conservative talk radio station. People can get access to Senator Gardner's event tonight by signing up for promotional materials for 710K and U.S. Radio. Both of those events begin at 7 o'clock. Sunny, windy today, and then in came the clouds this afternoon, all part of a weather system that will bring temperatures down tomorrow and bring real increase to the wind along the foothills. No advisories for the wind, but just know that it's coming. Temperature today, 72 Denver, 75 Springfield, 73 Eagle, and 80 in Grand Junction. This weather maker is going to move through quickly, kind of clipping northern Colorado with showers and thunderstorms to our north and east. Tonight, partly cloudy, breezy, and cool, our low 44. Sunshine, 68, a wind. Thursday. That front brings temperatures down Friday, but Friday's cool. A beautiful weekend, Mother's Day. The temperature is 68 with lots of sunshine. Early next week, cooler with a better chance of showers. That'll be both Monday and Tuesday afternoon. Denver Health paramedics were prepared for the worst for COVID-19. I mean, they think they were thinking that patients might overwhelm the system if Colorado was unable to flatten the curve. Instead, they tell our Mark Salinger. They are seeing the fewest calls in years. Outside Denver Health, it's quiet. From the street, you can't see the ventilators or the nurses or the doctors saving lives. What you can see are the ambulances parked out front. We were really getting, pre preparing ourselves to see sort of a New York City level overwhelming of our system. That hasn't happened. In fact, the number of calls paramedics at Denver Health ran in April is the lowest it's been in years. The non-COVID related calls have really taken, uh, have really decreased. Let's go back to April 2017, when there were more than 9,400 calls in one month. The following April, just over 9,100. April 2019 saw a jump to more than 9,600 calls. Then came the pandemic. April 2020, saw a drop of around 15% from typical call volume, down to less than 7,900 calls. It's not normal for us to have such a big drop in our call volume so suddenly. Steve Hulak is the captain of quality for the Denver Paramedic Division. He says paramedics are running between 15 and 25 COVID calls a day, but car accidents and other calls are down significantly. It is a little bit concerning to think about the patients with heart disease and, and, and other 
sort of chronic conditions who might be having some issues who aren't calling 911 right now. Under the new circumstances come new challenges. The ambulances are disinfected more, often multiple times a day. They use a special disinfectant applied by someone in full PPE, aimed at keeping patients and paramedics safe. We have paramedics who are out in Denver every day risking their, their health and their safety, um, taking care of people. And Denver Health says some of their paramedics have tested positive for COVID-19, though they won't tell us how many. They say some have recovered from the virus and then come back to work, Kyle. And, and Mark, I imagine this doesn't just impact the way that they respond to COVID-19 calls. They kind of have to go in assuming that somebody might not even be symptomatic and calling in with something else, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. At this point, they're treating every patient that they get a call to as potentially COVID-19 infected. That means they have to go everywhere with full PPE, which, of course, can be cumbersome. But if it keeps them safe, then it's a trade off that they're willing to take. For sure. All right. Mark Salinger reporting from what appears to be a beautiful backyard. It's a nice day outside. <laughs> Thanks, sir. We will celebrate gratitude at a time when it's sometimes tough to look beyond our own needs. With any challenge comes new opportunities. Teachers and the people who appreciate them, look up. This is for you. Next. This mural at Colfax and Williams got an artist from Denver some worldwide attention a few weeks back, and he has been a busy man since then. When we caught up with Austin Zucchini Fowler, we began to sense a theme in his work. And this one is Essential Idol. It sort of demonstrates the beautiful souls that these humans are with the angel wings. And it's right behind Bixby's Folly. Marla's opened up her wall for me to show appreciation to teachers. The dude out back is my new friend, Austin. Austin Zucchini Fowler, and I am a public art artist. My colleague, Cassie, came up with the idea of dedicating a mural to teachers. I'm super grateful for all the teachers and idols that I have in my life. We all have kids in school right now, and then we see how hard our teachers have worked, and we really felt that they needed that gratitude and appreciation as well. So this will be the fifth wall of gratitude that I'm working on. So it started with our healthcare professionals, and then it extended to a chef kind of showing our hospitality heroes. A few days ago, I did a construction worker. Now I'm working on a teacher. I was not planning to do a series, uh, but I th would say that the gratitude and the reception inspired me to do more. And we can choose to be negative or we can choose to find the bright spot in all of this. Austin's artwork is a bright spot. And I just want everyone to feel supported and to bring positivity to the community right now. A look through the lens of our photojournalist, Mike Grady. Austin has four more walls of gratitude planned, and he has countless ideas to keep that project going. Some people are not content simply to wear a mask themselves. No, they want to send a message. That and your feedback next. As we've been saying, Denver's public mask order goes into effect today. No mask order in Aurora, but they still want to discuss it. So that means that wearing a mask is up to the individual intelligence of each person in Aurora and each piece of shrubbery in Aurora. And it's Bush ain't a fool. Uh, Heather sent us a photo of a googly-eyed, masked-up hedge in her cul-de-sac in Aurora. That is no scrub brush there. That is a wise piece of shrubbery. So much feedback tonight about that threat of physical violence, that threat of civil war sent into Tri-County Health Department. Travis says, seriously, do we not see 600 folks at the Capitol last month of the hundreds of thousands, actually millions of people living in Colorado? He's talking about the reopened protesters versus everybody else. He says there's been exponentially more support about being realistically safe. Darren says, such a shame that health has become a political issue. Imagine if you got medical advice from a doctor based on what you want to hear. I actually think that's a lot of how, how a lot of people pick their doctors. I don't know. We'll see you next time.